Hey guys, good morning or afternoon, whatever time you're listening. We have brand new sweatshirts. Uh, this is the Explore Tennessee sweatshirt, which you can subscribe to that YouTube channel, Explore Tennessee. Uh, that's XPLR Tennessee. We have these few designs. So if you're interested in learning more of or colors. purchasing one, uh, DM us and we'll send you the prices. We're still putting it on the website as we speak. But we may have a little bit of a Black Friday slash... Cyber Monday slash <laughs> Christmas New Year sale. I like that. I it's, think that's, it's coming. It's, it's going to be all of the above. It's a big sale. Today we're doing a throwback episode, and you may be wondering why I'm wearing glasses. My wife is in the studio, and I just thought I would. I can actually see now with the glasses off. You wanted a good I history vibe. I want. Yeah, I felt like a grandpa in my new sweater. Look at this. Thing. Look at <laughs> this. It's so it's so nice. Uh, so we're doing a throwback episode with an author named Mark Zimmerman, and he is a Nashville. Uh, local. I don't know if he's a native here, uh, but he has published probably the most Nashville themed Civil War books. So this is his Amazon page uh, that we're looking at. Uh, I have I have three or four of his books. He is a fantastic author and he really writes uh, from a really good perspective on the history of the Civil War here in Nashville. Yeah, so that is, uh, stay tuned, that episode's coming in just a second. This episode is brought to you by thinkbrad.com. If you're looking for a home to buy if or, or you're looking to sell your home, if you're thinking Nashville, think Brad, you can reach out to Brad at 615-856-3270 or just go to thinkbrad.com. Also, we do want to remind you, this is a fantastic episode to gather around, have your family listen, because uh, who doesn't want to learn about history? Uh, so grab your family and then also sit down with a nice cup of coffee. Or hot chocolate. Or hot chocolate. But, or cider. Or cider. Or uh, pumpkin juice. But if you choose coffee, make sure it's Blessed Day Coffee. And with our code XPLR20 at checkout, you can get 20% off of some of the most fresh and sustainable coffee here in Nashville. You can get all that at blessedaycoffee.com. Also, if you if you are in Nashville, you get free delivery. So uh, take advantage of that. We do have a partnership with them on a few roasts called the uh, the Tennessee Blonde Roast in celebration with our Explore TN, our Explore Tennessee brand, um, and also the Nash Burrow uh, Espresso Roast for you dark roast lovers. You can get all that at Blessed Day Coffee. Dot com. All right, we won't delay you any further. Here is that throwback episode with author Mark Zimmerman. Hello and welcome to the Nashville Story. I'm Stuart Deming. And I'm Aaron Pennington. We have some history for you guys on today's Nashville Story. And you know we geek out about the history side of things. So we are very excited to bring you today's guest. Yeah, so joining us today is author of The Guide to Civil War in Nashville, Mark Zimmerman. I learned a ton in this interview. I'm so excited to present this to you guys. Yes, uh, Mark is, is extremely knowledgeable about the happenings of Nashville before our time and the impact it has had on Nashville during our time. So we talk about the Battle of Nashville. What led up to it? What were the some of the things that were happening in Nashville during that time and the result of the Battle of Nashville and its impact on the Civil War itself. So we are very excited that Mark is here to join us. Mark Zimmerman, thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful day in Nashville. We appreciate you taking out the time to uh, talk some history with us today. Thanks for having me. I, I'm, I'm curious, before we get into, before we time travel back uh, into the 1800s, I am very curious personally on how you got into um, writing about things like the the Battle of Nashville and, you know, getting into this topic. So well, what made you interested in this stuff and, and want to write about it? Well, uh, I grew up uh, during the 60s, which was a centennial of the Civil War. And we played, we played war, we played guns and so forth. And uh, uh, I grew up uh, in the upper Midwest. I was... I hate to admit it, but I actually was a Yankee at one time. Hey, Stuart's a Yankee, too. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm from upstate New York. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, and and uh, my interest kind of lapsed for a while until about uh, 
about 20, 25 years ago, and uh, uh, I've always been interested in history, and I've, uh, I've worked on newspapers and magazines, so I'm, I'm, I'm a writer, and I just got uh, interested in, in that. The Battle of Nashville, specifically, uh, there was a group uh, that formed uh, the Battle of Nashville Preservation Society, which is now the Battle of Nashville Trust, and I saw that they had done a uh, touring um, uh, guide in Blue and Gray magazine. Hmm. I was actually at Shiloh Bookstore and saw the magazine. I thought, heck, I live in Nashville. Let's let's take a look. So I bought the magazine and they took the tour. And uh, luckily, I didn't have any traffic accidents driving <laughs> around to, <laughs> to all the sites. Sure. Uh, but uh, and then I joined the the society uh, to learn all I could about the Battle of Nashville. And the more I learned, the more interesting it was. So, so uh, definitely interesting enough to um, write about it. So which I, I'm excited now to get into the details of of the Battle of of Nashville because you know we're we're sitting on an anniversary of the Battle of Nashville here in December. So I'm I'm, I'm curious about uh, we've we've been to Fort Negley. Um, and we did a podcast there, uh, but afterwards I knocked my head and forgot most of it. So, um, but it literally, so, <laughs> so I'll probably learn a lot here. Um, so, so to start off, what were the conditions? Because obviously a lot of stuff you hear during the civil wars, conditions were just right for this. What were the, the stage setting situations for Nashville in the beginning of the, of the Civil War? Uh, Nashville at the beginning of the Civil War? Yeah. Uh, it was a town of about 15,000 people. It was uh, one of the larger cities in the South. New Orleans was the, the largest one. Uh, but it, it sat on the Cumberland River, and the Cumberland River and the Tennessee River were the natural avenues of invasion into the Mid-South. Now, the defense of Nashville rested entirely on Fort Donaldson and Fort Henry. Mm. And Which Fort Donaldson is what, 16 miles away from Nashville, give or take 45 miles? Uh, uh, it's it's about an hour and a half okay. drive. to. Uh, it's at Dover, Tennessee. Okay. Um, and there's also uh, at Fort Donaldson, I, I, this is actually a fort I've never been to yet, and I, and I really want to go. Uh, but there's a bald eagles up there, right? Yes. There's a ton of bald eagles up there. I, I've actually seen them right on the battlefield. Oh, wow, that's um, amazing. And it's a very interesting battlefield, too. It's a national park. It's a park, mm. park service site. So when, did the, uh, so when did the Battle of Fort Donaldson happen in the timeline? Uh, it was uh, February, second uh, week in February of 1862. Uh, what happened was there was a um, combined Army and Navy expedition under U.S. Grant that uh, first took Fort Henry on the Tennessee River, uh, at the time of the battle, it was uh, one-third underwater. It was very poorly sighted. Mm. And uh, the U.S. Navy actually captured the fort before the Army even got there. And that opened up um, Tennessee River all the way uh, upriver to northern Alabama. But the key to Nashville was taking Fort Donaldson. And that happened. Um, the naval battle at Fort Donaldson was on Valentine's Day. And um, the Confederates actually won that battle, but the uh, Confederates actually ended up uh, surrendering to Grant, uh, surrendering the fort. 15,000 Confederate uh, soldiers were captured and sent north. Uh, And that pretty much opened the way to Nashville. There was three forts at Clarksville, which were all abandoned by the time the uh, gunboat uh, flotilla got there. There was also a Fort Zollicoffer in West Nashville on the Cumberland uh, that was uh, a pretty strong fortification, but it it was uh, abandoned and destroyed by the time the federal uh, gunboats got there. And, uh, of course, the population of Nashville thought that the uh, Yankees, who they uh, thought was the equivalent basically of pirates and outlaws, would would come and burn the city down and shut the city down. Um, under the uh, overall authority uh, of the U.S. Army, it was Buell's army coming down from Bowling Green that actually uh, was given the authority to capture Nashville coming down through Edgefield. Mm. 
Uh, they did not shell the town. As a matter of fact, they uh, they captured Nashville without firing a shot. Really? This was February 26th, 1862, and Nashville remained in federal hands for the remainder of the war. So, so how did that happen without them firing a shot? Was it just an overwhelming of troops? Well, the um, Army of, um, of Tennessee under um, Albert Sidney Johnston um, abandoned Nashville. Um, oh, they, wow. They had hoped that he would have fought for it, but he uh, abandoned and actually ended up going down to Corinth and setting up the Battle of Shiloh in April. So I'm, I'm guessing... That was a pretty strategic move yes. for for the for the union and really set them up for success in in the long run. What was the importance of having Nashville for the the Union Army? Well, Nashville was the first uh, Confederate capital to fall, and it was used during the war as a massive uh, logistics base. Mm. Uh, uh, when Sherman took Atlanta in 1864, he couldn't have done it without having Nashville firsthand. Is that because of the uh, train lines? Uh, yeah. Did they connect to Atlanta in that time by the end of the Civil War? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, Atlanta was a well, was a rail hub at the time. Mm-hmm. It, it was not the capital of Georgia at the time. Mill- Milledgeville was. Uh, but Nashville, even today, you can see six interstates going through it, um, a river. It was a transportation hub, mm-hmm. and uh, it could take uh, supplies from Louisville and Cincinnati down the uh, railroad, or it could take it uh, uh, going down the Ohio River and up the Cumberland, and then it could also take supplies uh, up the Tennessee to Johnsonville yep. and then eastward uh, on the railroad to Nashville, and then uh, from Nashville down through Chattanooga, uh, there were other su- supply bases built. Um, did did Fort Negley play a role in the logistics of that? Because, you know, Stuart and I were talking about this before. Uh, obviously, a lot was fought. Fort Negley was, was very strategic, strategic in its location. Mm-hmm. Obviously, sits up pretty high on a hill. Um, and obviously, a lot of troops could be there at Fort Negley. Uh, but not a lot happened there. It happened a lot south of, of Nashville. So, you know, what was the you know, reason for building a fort, uh, that, you know, didn't up, ended up getting used. Was it more for, you know, having a lot of troops and being able to do something with them? Well, actually, uh, Fort Negley and many of the fortifications around Nashville, there are actually two fortification lines, inner and outer, uh, were not really completed until 1864. Well, okay. uh, however, Fort Negley, uh, I believe was completed in 1863, uh, it was a showcase. Uh, it was uh, designed by um, uh, uh, St. Clair Morton of Philadelphia, who was a... Uh, he was a West Point graduate, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. yeah. And he was a famous engineer. Mm. And uh, I think he wanted to kind of show off a little bit with Fort Nagley. <laughs> it was the largest stone fortification built during the war. Yeah. Uh, it was a Star War, uh, Star Force. I, I, I like Star Wars better, so. <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> uh, I, can, I can imagine. The Civil Skywalker. War was won because of a Star War. Exactly. I like that. <laughs> exactly. Uh, just, just a reminder, uh, Fort Nagley was built by enslaved people, um, partially from the city of Nashville, so we do have to keep that as a reminder. Well, they were, they were not slaves at the time. They were called contrabands. They were freed slaves. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were basically worked to death uh, under the federal authorities building Fort Negley. I forget how many died there on the site, uh, but it was it was quite a few. Yeah, and uh, since we're, we'll just come to modern Nashville, uh, part of the, uh, there was a plan about two years ago here in the city of Nashville to develop Fort Negley, and they actually found some bodies. Like right where Greer Stadium was. Yeah, like right where Greer Stadium was, and they found bodies that were with unmarked graves, and so they can't develop that area now. So mm-hmm. fast forwarding a little bit, the war yeah. is still affecting Nashville today. Yeah. Yes, uh, I'd put a plug in for Fort Negley. It's it's got a great visitor center and it's it's um, open to the public and it's free and uh, you can walk up to the fort and uh, it's got a lot of interpretive signage that tells uh, the story of the fort. Does does that seem to be, you know, are we spoiled here with having Fort Negley? I mean, I've been down to uh, some other Civil War sites 
that haven't been, you know, touched uh, as as much. But, you know, I think there are far, you know, very few places like Fort Negley where, you know, you can, you know, walk around like the soldiers did even mm-hmm. inside the fort. Are, are we kind of spoiled with having Fort Negley here compared to some other Civil War sites? Uh, in a way, uh, because it's a unique fort because of its size and so forth but we you know we don't have a national battlefield park here in nashville okay the battle that battle of nashville is one of the largest battles geographically mm. uh, of the war um but um it, you know it, it was not developed as a matter of fact most of south nashville sits on the battlefield yeah which is they still crazy. find shells in their backyards oh and so wow forth. oh yeah Golly. Uh, I'm, I'm curious what Nashville, because, I mean, there was a, a quite an extensive period between the occupation of Nashville and the Battle of Nashville. Uh, so what was going on during that time? Obviously, you talked about logistics, but uh, what else was going on during that time? And, and, you know, what was the feeling of Nashville under occupation? What, what was going on during that time? Well, there were uh, the population of Nashville was quite defiant uh, under federal authority. Um, um, Andrew Johnson was um, the military governor at the time mm. in the state capitol. He took a lenient uh, approach at first, but didn't get much cooperation. Uh, so he ended up ruling it pretty much with an iron hand. A lot of the um, pro-Confederate um, uh, men were sent uh, north, uh, imprisoned. Um, but... Uh, the Federals uh, really built up Nashville quite a bit. It was a main railroad hub, so there were a lot of railroad shops and mm. mechanics here. Uh, it was also a vast uh, military hospital base. Interesting. I believe there were 25 buildings that were military hospitals. What if, it, uh, do, this is just kind of off the cuff, but would we be a healthcare capital if it wasn't for that, or did that contribute at all to Nashville's healthcare industry? Or do you think that's separate? I suppose it, it did in a way. That's interesting. Uh, maybe not directly, but we, we uh, could maybe tie that loose correlation to it. Yeah, sure. Huh. Sure. So w- what was everyday life like for, for somebody? Were they able to go about their life normally under occupation? Uh, no, not really, but uh, th- there were people eventually who decided to cooperate just to get business done. Um, and there were a few people that made uh, quite a bit of money during the war, mm. uh, profiteers and so forth. Um, I, I think I think uh, business went on pretty well, pretty normally. Of course, uh, obviously, the uh, uh, slave owners, um, you know, there were, there were actually uh, plantation owners, slave owners who were pro, pro-union, pro-federal, hmm. um, but eventually, obviously, the, um, the, the slaves were, were freed. Um, the, the town grew quite a bit. In, in the 19, 1860s, it grew by 50% Oh, in wow. So, so it went up to, from 15,000 to around 30,000 in the 60s? Okay. Correct, correct. Uh, during the, towards the end of the war, there was a lot of refugees yeah. coming into Nashville. The, the surrounding countryside was just devastated. Hmm. Um, and there were a lot of prisoners coming north through Nashville to the northern uh, prisoner of war camps. Uh, there were spies. Um, there was a part of Nashville called Smoky Row that was a center of prostitution and and uh, low life, I guess you'd mm-hmm. say. Mm. Uh, it was a it was a bustling town. Yeah. Well, it was you know because Nashville you know ended up getting uh, occupied by the the Union. When that happened, was Nashville pretty much split between, I mean, obviously a lot of Kentucky and Tennessee had these things where you hear brother fought against brother kind of deals. What was what was Nashville's feeling um, either before or during occupation about where people ended up lining up on, on either side? Well, Tennessee was um, um, somewhat peculiar that, uh, originally, they voted against seceding, um, but uh, when Lincoln called for troops to be raised to invade the South, put down the rebellion, uh, they switched, um, and they were pro-secession. Mm. Mm. Nashville was mostly pro-Confederate. Okay. Um, there were, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting, a lot of the uh, 
men who would become Confederate officers were against secession. Uh, but once Tennessee seceded, they went with their with their home state. Hmm. Wow. Uh, can, we, can we talk about mo- a little bit more about the o- occupation of Nashville? How many federal soldiers would have been stationed in this city? Uh, it, it, it varied by week. Yeah, of course. Uh, there were lots huh. of camps, uh, as, especially around Fort Nagley. There were mm-hmm. lots of camps there. Uh, Nashville, uh, except for uh, the end of 1862, was not really much of a staging area as far as the troops being okay. accumulated here. And, and of course, uh, the Battle of Nashville also. Uh, but mostly material uh, mm. okay. was stored here. Well, was there a lot of, um, like, food coming through here as well? Like some, like, oh, oh, cows yeah. and pigs and all that stuff coming through all the train systems? Yeah, uh, most of it w- would be processed, Okay, however. Um Ammunition, clothing, shoes, blankets, uniforms, um, masses, massive amounts of supplies uh, coming through. One of the things, you know, before the Battle of, of Nashville, Stuart and I were looking at a map and Stuart was kind of showing me that here's here's where the, the Union line was, here's where the Confederate line was, and you see the Union line kind of making its way south and also west. What were the strategic... Um, opportunities of moving that that line south and west of protection for uh, Nashville, maybe versus east. Was it mainly the river that they that they used for that guiding line? Yeah, Nashville sits in the bend of the river, and uh, the uh, Union or Federal defensive lines uh, ran from um, where the old water plant used to be, the old General Hospital used to be mm. to the east. Uh, right there, it's like on uh, Hermitage Avenue, First Avenue, yeah, the General Hospital, yep. Correct. And then it would run down to where Fort Negley was, mm-hmm. and then basically through where uh, Vanderbilt University is now, okay. up uh, through basically where uh, West End and, and 440 intersect. So like uh, Love Circle type area? Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. That was, that was, there was, I believe there was a fort on top of Love Circle. Um and the uh, it ran all the way to the river uh, at in the west. So almost also. to almost through like Bellevue type situation, or like no, uh, no. Charlotte, like where Charlotte Avenue would be today. Correct. Okay, uh, where Charlotte Avenue, Bell's Bend area. Yep. Uh, even north of that, actually. I'm curious now that you've done all this research and you you can identify all of these locations. Is it interesting to drive through a 2020? Nashville and know, like, for example, at Love Circle, okay, the, I'm standing right now where this fort was or driving through Charlotte or Westmead or anything and, and know this is what happened. What's that like being able to, to know what happened in, in Nashville in different parts? Well, it's, it's uh, somewhat difficult to connect all the different sites and, and, and see where you are, but um, I, I thought it would be interesting to write a book uh, about the Battle of Nashville with the current with location. Location, yeah. You know, uh, Thomas's army would would, would uh, march down West End <laughs> Avenue and that sort of thing. That would be cool. When we get to a space where everything is augmented reality, and we can, you know, put on or or you know look at the camera the through our phone, and we can you know watch. Uh, augmented live reenactments of what was going on there, that day will come. I think that oh, will be it, really exciting. It's already here. Yeah. Uh, there are. We virtual, just need it for Nashville. <laughs> yeah. It, it would be very difficult to do it with Nashville. Um, the battlefield is lost. Um, there's just pockets. Of, mm-hmm. There's about two dozen different sites that you can go to, you know, Shies Hill, readout number one. Yeah, uh, uh, traveler, Traveler's Rest, right? That was occupied by the Confederates during the war? Uh, no. Uh, that was the home of John Overton. Okay, the, uh, the judge for the city of Nashville, right? right. Okay. And he, he went south. A lot of the uh, wealthy hive, hive officials that were pro-Confederate went south mm-hmm. when, when the feder- uh, Federals came in. Okay, so like the McGavicks and right. some, yeah, some of them. Yeah. So they all went down to like Mississippi and everything. Right. Mm-hmm. One of the exceptions was... Um, President Polk's widow. Um, President Polk died in 1949, and his widow lived until eight, the 1890s. 
she lived at Polk Place, which was fairly near the the U.S. Uh, the state capital. Yeah, it's and, like uh, uh, so. It's it, it's like maybe you could literally throw a stone from the capital to. It's where their the house. YWCA. Yep. Uh, ah, okay. And uh, every general that came to Nashville, Grant, Sherman, Thomas, uh, Buell, uh, was obliged to pay her a visit um, upon arrival in the city, and she always made it plain whose side that she. Uh, <laughs> which was the Confederate side. Because um, Sarah, she was down, was she from Columbia in that area, or she was from North Carolina like James? I want to say she was from Murfreesboro, but I'm not sure okay. about that Sarah Childress Polk. Okay. Uh, and she was she was quite the lady. She, mm-hmm. she was one of his major advisors. Between her and um, Adelisha Ackland or yes. Belmont, they were the grand dame. <laughs> well, let's, let's actually talk about the yeah. Adelisha Ackland uh, for a second. So she has a fascinating story, and we haven't actually told her story here on the podcast. We, we, we've, te- we've teased it, but we know there's there's a lot more to be told. Um, and from what I remember, she had, uh, I think it was upwards to four husbands. Uh, her first husband, three husbands, okay. Uh, so her first husband was a former slave trader. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the other two husbands, I don't think, matter more in that story. But could we, we could talk about her life for a second. Sure. She lived on the property of uh, Belmont University. That's where that currently is today. That, that was their summer cottage okay. that, that they stayed at. Um, she married, um, well, she was... Uh, um, uh, daughter of one of the founders of Nashville, and she married Isaac Franklin, who had uh, the Fairview Plantation up near Gallatin, um, tremendously wealthy, and uh, they owned plantations down in Louisiana, so they would spend time there, and uh, they built Belmont as a, a, a summer cottage. Wow. Um, and uh, he was a lot older than she was, and and when he died... She uh, got most of his estate. She was a very astute businesswoman, a uh, very independent woman. And uh, like you said, she married twice again. I forget how many children she had, quote, um, six, seven, eight children. Yeah, and a, a, few, of them, a few of them died at, at birth. Right. And, um, but it, it, what's really fascinating about her is this was before the 1920s with the right to women to vote, and she was able to operate some of these plantations after her first husband died. Correct? Is that correct? Correct. So with the so the, the summer cottage uh, at Belmont uh, wasn't it? They own. They were one of the largest landowners in Nashville at one point. How much land did they own in that area? I can't tell you exactly, but Belmont was a big estate. Uh, they had, uh, you know, they had a bear house. They had a water tower, which still stands. Well, what's a bear? Yeah, what's so a bear like, house? That, that, would, that would way past what I know about. It's uh, a zoo. You know, it's a little house. Oh, is it oh, really? Okay. It had a bear in it. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. They had all kinds of exotic animals there. Wow. And, uh, I think they had a bowling alley and... Fountains, of course, gardens. Um, so almost like the uh, the Biltmore Estate, just a little, just a little smaller in size, yeah, but yeah, but same smaller. themes and everything. Right. Yeah. Uh, she was quite the socialite, and yeah, uh, uh, she managed during the war to vie uh, the federal authorities versus the Confederate uh, military uh, to harvest her cotton down in Louisiana and have it shipped to England. And I think she sold it for a million dollars, which wow. back then was a billion yeah. dollars. <laughs> <laughs> wow. One, one of the things I think is really interesting is when you get into, you know, even you, you get into a lot of other Nashville history just by accident mm-hmm. when studying a lot of this stuff, a lot of names pop up that you realize, oh, that's why this is McGavick Pike. That's why uh, we have the name you know, Belmont. I mean, so many names just connect. W- was that a fun process as uh, going through the, in learning about the history of, of Nashville, discovering all of the, the, the names that we know today as something and figuring out where the origins of, of that lie and how everything connected so well. It seemed like everybody knew everybody or everybody was it really did. To everybody. And it's very interesting. Uh, you hear about a lot of these generals, during the war, but it's also interesting to find out what they did before the war and mm. what they did after the war. Um, and of course, the, the war took out a lot of uh, valuable people yeah. that, that would have survived and 
and gone on. But uh, yeah, it, it is. It's all interconnected. You're absolutely right that everybody knew everybody in Nashville. I mean, we so we are doing currently a you know a tour around Nashville in the 12 South neighborhood, and we realized at Sunnyside that that's connected to Andrew Jackson. And Andrew Johnson, is that right? Uh, James K. Polk. J- or, or James K. Polk. Yeah, because she was the, uh, Mary Benton was the cousin of Sarah Polk. Uh, and it's it just, it, it, so we've covered four neighborhoods in Nashville. We've covered Berry Hill, uh, Wedgwood, Houston, and Waverly Place. And now we're in 12 South. And it's just, it's fascinating how interconnected the entire story of Nashville is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So now it is wartime. Um, what led? What were some of the conditions that led to? Obviously, uh, we had the Federal Army in Nashville. What were some of the conditions that ended up leading to a Battle of Nashville? Because the first one was more of an occupation uh, in here, but but the Battle of Nashville uh, that happened in our city. What were some of the conditions that led to that happening? Well, I, I like to go back to um, the fall of Atlanta. Uh, when General John, Bed, John Bell Hood and his army of Tennessee abandoned Atlanta and Sherman occupied it. Uh, long story short, what happened after that is that uh, Hood turned northward to invade Tennessee. Uh, Sherman went on his march to the sea. To, to Savannah. S- to Savannah, Georgia, mm-hmm. <laughs> headed in opposite directions, <laughs> uh, which caused a lot of consternation in Washington uh, Sherman left um, uh, the commander of, of, of the Army of the Cumberland, George Henry Thomas, in charge of Nashville at that time. And uh, uh, Sherman took a lot of his best men with him on, on mm. his march. Hood went into northern Alabama. He uh, squandered about two weeks waiting for logistics for the railroad to be repaired and then and then moved north into Tennessee with the object of capturing Nashville. Uh, you, you you can't talk about the Battle of Nashville without talking about the Battle of Franklin. Of course. Right, yeah. yes. And you can't talk about that without talking about Spring Hill. Right. So, uh, one thing led to another. Schofield's army evaded escape or evaded capture at Spring Hill. Hood attacked uh, Schofield's army at Franklin. It was a debacle. Um, 6,000 casualties, uh, 12 Confederate generals either killed, wounded, or captured. Wow. And quite a few of the officer corps uh, wiped out. Um, and then after that, uh, Schofield, who didn't want to do battle in the first place, skedaddled back to Nashville and the fortifications, and Hood uh, uh, moved on to Nashville and, and set up a siege line He didn't have nearly enough men to uh, completely form the semicircle around Nashville. How many many, uh, soldiers did he have after the Battle of Franklin? Was it 25,000? That's about correct. Okay. Uh, He sent two-thirds of his cavalry under Nathan Bedford Forrest to Murfreesboro. Okay. Uh, There was a big garrison there at at, um, Fortress Rosecrans Uh in Murfreesboro, and uh, Forrest declined to attack that fort, but he kept those Union soldiers at, at bay. Mm. Um, it, it was a bad decision by Hood to leave Forrest out of the Battle of Nashville. Um, now, what's interesting is that the Army of Tennessee under Hood was rather ragtag, especially after the Battle of Franklin. Sure. Demoralized to some extent. The weather was horrible. It and there's, there's stories of seven- or eight-year-old boys that Hood got to start fighting for his his side. I hadn't heard of that, but I, I wouldn't yeah. I wouldn't doubt it. Um, but the 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 Federal Army also was very ragtag. Um, they were very concerned that there wasn't enough uh, Federal soldiers. Interesting in Nashville. Um, General, did, did they diverge their resources, or did they think Nashville was was, was safe and try to go to other areas at the time? Well. Uh, before Hood's invasion, the Union forces were dispersed throughout yeah. Tennessee, and mm-hmm. they were just basically garrison forces. Uh, there was the huge 16th Corps of uh, Andrew Jackson Smith that was in Missouri and came by steamboat uh, to 
Nashville, got there around December the 2nd. Uh, Thomas was so glad to see Smith, he gave him a bear hug. <laughs> uh, he, was an, he was usually not a very emotional man, but <laughs> he gave him a bear hug. Uh, those were veteran grizzled soldiers. Uh, they, mm-hmm. they called them Smith's guerrillas. And uh, also Steedman's um, provisional detachment, they called, came up from Chattanooga. Um, they had the garrison troops. They had Thomas John Wood's 4th Corps. Of course, they had Schofield's 23rd Corps. Uh, and they also had the U.S. Colored Troops. Um, and I'm not sure how many uh, uh, regiments there were. I believe there was four or five of U.S. Colored Troops, were, which, of course, were freed slaves who had uh, been enlisted and were yeah. in uniform and uh, actually fought at the Battle of Nashville. Uh, I'm curious, what was, what was on the line for, for Nashville? If, you know, if, if things were to go differently uh, during that battle time, let's, let's say that maybe the Confederate didn't lose as many uh, in, in Franklin and, and the weather was better or something like that, what was on the line for Nashville if that battle, if the Confederate would have succeeded in that, in that battle? So just to kind of set up the context of, you know, you know, how crucial or critical Nashville either was or wasn't? That's a very good question. If Hood had not delayed in northern Alabama, if the Battle of Franklin had not happened, um, I believe Nashville probably still could have held. However, that's a very interesting question. If uh, if Hood had used all of his men to uh, the best utility, they probably would have attacked from the west, bypassed Fort Negley, mm. which was impregnable, really. Right. Although there was talk at one time, supposedly, of, of forming a suicide squad to attack Fort Negley. Oh, wow. Um, it's it's possible uh, they, they could have captured Nashville, but not likely. Would it have been a... A, a turn of events kind of thing would that have impacted the entirety of the Civil War if if Nashville would have been uh, overturned to the Confederate? I think it would have prolonged it. Interesting. Uh, the ending would still be the same. Okay. It, it may have prolonged it for six more months. Wow. And a lot of people in Cincinnati and Louisville would be very scared. <laughs> That's very yeah. true. Uh, so with the Hood's army and Thomas's army, um, how many people? over this battle. So this battle happened December 15th and 16th mm-hmm. of 1864. Right. Uh, how many people were on both sides? How many people were with the Confederates? How many people were with the Federal Army? Well, uh, a, lot, a lot of numbers are, are indefinite, but um, the Federals had about 55,000. Mm. Wow. The Confederates had about 23,000. Wow. So there was about 80,000. Men involved. Wow. And then how many men were uh, with Nathan Bedford Forrest? Uh, There were two divisions. um, Gosh, that's about 8,000 men. Okay. Something like that. Um, uh, One of the reasons the Battle of Nashville is not more well known is that it, it wasn't a bloody battle like Shiloh or Stones River. Um, It, uh, the figures I have here is that for the entire campaign, there were 3,000 casualties. Oh, wow. For the Federals, uh, three about 330 killed. Uh, for the Confederates, the numbers are, are hazy, um, but about 6,000. And mm. 4,462 of those were captured during the Battle of Nashville. Oh, wow. Uh, so again, it, there wasn't a lot of uh, men killed. Yeah, it, it was a violent battle, of course. But. Do you think so? If we if we talk about Nash- Nashville as a whole, so if we're looking down from a satellite, uh, you're going to have an area of Nashville called Oak Hill, which has a lot of uh, rolling hills in Middle Tennessee, and then you have uh, where Radnor Lake is today. That wasn't actually a lake at this time during this no. battle. That was actually farmland. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. Uh, but do you think the terrain in some of this South Nashville area uh, had an impact on uh, the casualties? Because maybe because of all the hills and stuff, there wasn't as many casualties as you would have had uh, for the Battle of Stones River or even the Battle of Franklin. That's a very good question. Um, I address a lot of that in, in one of my books called Mud, Blood, and Cold Steel, which is basically starts out from Shy's Hill. And, and the, where, where exactly uh, is Shy's Hill? 
Uh, Shy's Hill is off a of Harding uh, uh, place. Gotcha. Uh, off of Benton Smith Road. Oh, yeah. It's that big hill that you go up on. Hard. Yeah, I know exactly yeah. where it is. Yep. Uh, and you can go up there. There's a trailhead there. Uh, and at the top, uh, you can see where where the men were. It has uh, some cannon up there and some flags. Oh, great. And, uh, it's, a, it's a real nice place to, to visit. Uh, the Battle of Nashville Trust um, um, maintains that. Okay. Uh, they just put a couple of howitzers up there also. Oh, wow. Um, okay. um, uh, General Beauregard's son had a artillery battery, and that was his uh, howitzers there on the side of the hill. Oh, okay. wow. But anyway, uh, your question, um, uh, um, Granny White Pike was cut off to the south for their escape route, so most of the men from Shy's Hill were going southeastward, and there were the Overton Hills there, yeah. uh, which are very steep. Yeah. Uh, and some tried to go through there, but most uh, cut over to Franklin Pike, um, north of those hills, um, down around Harding and Franklin, um, down where John Overton High School is. Yeah. Uh, one of the Confederate commanders, uh, Stephen Lee, uh, put up a fight there uh, to hold back the federal troops. Mm. It pretty much saved Hood's command from total capture or wow. annihilation uh it, it was some uh, uh very uh, brisk and sharp fighting there and after that it was it was a running retreat uh, over 10 days and 100 miles all the way down to the tennessee river in northern alabama what was the, the totality of duration of the battle of nashville was it that that 10 day period or did it stretch over a longer or shorter period of time? Well, well, the Battle of Nashville was the two days. Gotcha. The, the 15th and the 16th. And then it's it's just basically called the, the retreat, the Battle of Nashville retreat. Gotcha. Um, and, of course, there was two weeks uh, where the armies basically sat at Nashville before the battle happened on the 15th. Uh, it was delayed mostly because of uh, winter weather. Because there was a at this time there was there was a big snowstorm that came through. Yes, um, the, the, I think I heard through the grapevine there there was like maybe even like nine or ten inches of snow in some places. I, I'm not sure it was that much snow. It was ice, okay, basically that made. Yeah, um, we, we don't get operations. snow down here. Yeah, <laughs> no. Well, no. Back, <laughs> hey, back in the day they used to get snow. That's how James Robinson crossed the river. Oh to wow, found Fort Nashboro. So. It, back, back in the day, yes. It was a particularly severe winter uh, in the last weeks of December Okay, in, in, in Tennessee. It, it, it kind of seems like, you know, with, with the inclement matter, weather, with the, the Battle of Franklin, with, uh, with, with all of that stuff, it really seems like uh, the stage was set for this to be almost the last chance for the Confederates to do anything. Now I kind of understand what you say of it may have delayed it because, you know, that if—, if the federal troops didn't win, uh, then, you know, the Confederates seemed like they would have gained a lot of strength in reconnecting and, and everything in, in Nashville and, you know, obviously had more supplies then. Um, so w was that the case? Was was it kind of the the last chance when they're fighting in that inclement weather when, you know, after major losses and they just continue to keep advancing, it, w was that kind of their, their last chance at, at – you know, making any grounds in this area. Well, what I, I like to call Hood's invasion uh, desperate. It, it, desperate. it sounds like it. It does. Desperate times. Yeah. Uh, for the Federals, it, it was decisive. Uh, the battle was a decisive victory for for the uh, Federals. It was the last major battle in the Western theater mm. in the war. So, um, uh, one of the questions that that I raise in the books is uh, why the Southern soldiers fought for so long under such terrible conditions. Sure, yeah. Knowing that, knowing pretty much what the outcome was going to be. Right. That doesn't seem very hopeful after the Battle of Franklin going into Nashville with, you know, half of the army of what you're, you're staring down. Well, even at Nashville, there was ample opportunity for them to surrender. Oh, wow. And, and some of them did, of course, but... But then to go the next 10 days, uh, some of them barefoot in freezing weather, ice uh, over 100 miles, um, you know. Uh, I, I think one of the reasons is that 
uh, they were scared to death of northern prisoner of war camps. Mm. Uh, the the um, oh, especially up towards Michigan and stuff, and how bad the conditions up Chicago, there. Are in there Michigan. was a Camp yeah. Douglas in Chicago was was notorious, and I believe that the um, rumors were that you know you go to that camp and you don't survive, oh, which, wow. which is not exactly true. But it a lot of a lot of Confederate the largest burial ground. Uh, of Confederates outside the South is in Chicago. Mm. Oh, I had no, I had no idea from that prisoner of war camp. Yeah. Wow, that's wild. So let's uh, let's talk about the aftermaths of the battle. So, what was the condition of Nashville uh, after the ten days? How much did like how long did it take Nashville to recover from this battle? Nashville, uh, amazingly, the battle was fought south of the city. The city at that time was about where the um, inner loop of the interstate is now. Okay. Yeah. And uh, actually, it's hard to believe, but during the battle, business went on pretty much as normal in the city. If, if I can remember this right, there was a circus. There was a circus yeah. going on at the time. Is that is that right? Yeah. Only they 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 uh, commandeered the horses for the federal cavalry. <laughs> That's how hard up they were for horses. Oh, wow. At the end of the war, it's estimated that 10,000 horses died during the retreat from Nashville. Just wow. Just of, of exposure. Oh, people, wow. Worked to death. Huh. Um, but Nashville, uh, was w- the city itself was hardly touched by the war. It was built up. And so after the war, Nashville was pretty much ready to move on. But like I said, the surrounding countryside was just devastated. Well, there's still uh, there's still reports coming from Franklin around that time of bodies just still laying on the ground, and they weren't buried until after the New Year. Yeah, uh, there, like reports coming out of Franklin. I, I just can't imagine like living in that small town of Franklin of 700 people during that time. And you're still having these rotting bodies. Thankfully, it was cold, so you didn't have the smell, but you had the smell coming. Yeah. The, uh, a lot of times what they would do is that they would bury the bodies, but it would be so shallow that with the rains and so forth, they, they would, you know, kind of rise to the top. Yeah. Jeez. Um, but, you know, it doesn't matter which side you're on. An army tromping through your property is going to devastate it. They're going to take all the livestock. They're going to take the uh, wooden railings down and use it for firewood. Um a lot of farmers were were wiped out, and of course the men were in the army, and the women were uh, left to um, um, take care of the homesteads, fend for themselves. Yeah. Basically, mm. that's huh. that's true. So what? So after everything said and done, the Civil War is now finished. Um, all this stuff happened with Abraham Lincoln and assassination. What happened to General Hood and John Schofield after the Civil War? Okay, uh, John Schofield was an, a career army man. But he became uh, commandant of West Point. Uh, he became the uh, commander of the U.S. Army, uh, the, the whole army uh, from 1888 to eight, nine, 1895. I oh, wow, I had, no, I had no idea. Oh, okay. yeah. Uh, he was awarded the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor, uh, which was kind of dubious. Uh, <laughs> but he, he was the one that suggested that the U.S. put a naval base at Pearl Harbor. Oh wow! Yeah, there's a Schof- smart man. <laughs> there's a Schof- Schofield barracks there okay. at, at Pearl Harbor. Uh, Hood, um, Hood, of course, was was disabled. Um, his right leg was amputated, and his left arm was shattered and useless. Um, he retired to New Orleans and uh, married, and I believe he sired ten children after oh, wow. the war. Several sets of twins. Uh, devastatingly. Um, around 1872, I uh, believe it was typhoid came through, killed him, his wife, and several of his children. Uh, Hood was kind of a tragic figure. Um, he he gained a lot of fame during the early part of the war. He was disabled. He wasn't really capable of, of commanding a whole army. It was beyond his pay grade, so to speak. Um, and uh, he didn't take care of logistics, the, the small details that needed to be taken care of. And the worst part of it was that he, he blamed his failures on his men, Ooh. which was unforgivable, really. Um, Hood and Thomas met after the war uh, for a couple hours in a hotel room, talked over the old days. Did that happen here, here in uh, Nashville? 
I believe it was in New Orleans. Okay, gotcha. Um, and, uh, of course, Thomas was a Virginian who had remained loyal to the Union, and Hood lamented that he, he should have stayed with his state and fought mm. you know, with him uh, for the Confederacy because Hood, Hood thought a lot of Thomas uh, wow. as a commander. Well, so the aftermath of, of Nashville after the war... Um, did it take a while? Obviously, you know, we didn't, like you said, to see a lot of, of physical damage within the city. Um, what was the process like of Nashville returning back to, uh, normal? How did the end of the war really affect the city? Uh, was it anything that, you know, a lot of people obviously probably, you know, moved out of Nashville. So I don't, it, was there any residual effects of, a, a, an occupancy in, in Nashville. Well, uh, I believe the federal troops were here until 1866. Uh, Reconstruction uh, went on until, I believe, the election of Rutherford B. Hayes, and then they withdrew the troops. Um, there was a lot of friction, uh, a, a lot of it because of, of black soldiers mm. Having arms, um, rifles, and so forth, and that didn't sit well with the southern population at the time. Uh, there were still a lot of feuds and um, and debts to be uh, settled. And, wow. uh, lots, of, still lots of violence, even though you know it, it wasn't war. Uh, Nashville uh, pretty pretty much prospered. Um, a lot of the uh, Northerners uh, officers that were down here. For the war became industrialists after the war, and they realized a lot of the, the potential here in Tennessee to industrialize mm. or exploit the resources here. Right. So uh, the railroads were were improved. Sure. And, um, and Nashville became you know a trading center. Uh, probably wasn't until World War II though that it, that it really took off. Yeah. And of course nowadays we're having another invasion of Yankees. <laughs> yeah, Yankees, yeah, California. Explosion, really, yeah, yeah. It, it is really interesting to see, um, you know, remnants of the, the Civil War in Nashville. Are, are there any uh, any glaring things that you see that uh, you know a 2020 Nashville has in its midst because? of what happened during the Civil War. Obviously, you know, Fort Negley is a given, right? The park is there. People are able to visit it, which is crazy. It's so close to a downtown of a, of a major city. but And most people have no idea it's there. Yeah, it, it, it looks like a big hill to most people from a, a long way away. Well, let me tell you a little story, and maybe you know this already, but um, uh, the, the gentleman that started the Battle of Nashville Preservation Society went to uh, then Mayor Bredesen, and they had a aerial photograph of Fort Negley taken during the 30s when it was rebuilt. Mm. And uh, Mayor Bredesen said, wow, that's, that, that's spectacular. He said, where is this fort? And they said, it's a mile down that way. <laughs> and he said, we got to do something about that. <laughs> and so they, they did a master plan and study and so forth, and they decided that it would be too much to try and rebuild the fort uh, they they wanted to interpret the ruins, and Nashville appropriated two million dollars to to build up Fort Negley, which was the largest municipal appropriation for for, wow. for Civil War project. There there really isn't a whole lot to see uh, if you compare Nashville to Shiloh or Stones River, sure, even Fort Donaldson. You have to use your imagination a lot. Yeah, I, any residual effects not you know, physical structures, but, um, either, you know, Nashville ways of, of doing things or industries, uh, that you think are, you know, still affected today or still have remnants of, you know, this would not be happening in Nashville if it wasn't for, uh, the events that took place in, in Nashville during the civil war time. That's, uh, again, an interesting question. Nashville was the capital uh, of Tennessee by the time of the war. Right. Um, the interstate system coming through, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, in a lot of ways, the, the feds came back and, and still continued building infrastructure 
around Nashville. Hmm. You look at uh, Old Hickory Lake and yeah. Percy Priest Lake. Look at uh, I sixty five and and I forty going going through Fort Campbell, uh, Arnold Engineering um, Base, um, all federal projects. Um, there's still I grew up uh, in the Upper Midwest and like I said, uh, the centennial of the Civil War and we were you know kind of studying ancient history. Come down here, it's not ancient history. It, to some extent, it's still going on. No, you, 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 have, you, have, uh, you still have some first, second generation people from this war that are like their ancestors died on this land. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's heritage to them. And yeah. they're very proud of their ancestors for fighting for what they believed in. Uh, there was, it's a famous incident where uh, uh, a captured. A Confederate soldier. It was uh, asked by uh, his Yankee guard, "Why are you fighting us?" And he said, "Because you're here. Uh, <laughs> you know, you're, in, you're, you're, yeah. you're invading our territory. You know, uh, and and like they said, you know, there was an aristocracy in the South uh, that owned slaves, um, and that the question needed to be handled, and yeah. settled. Um, Six hundred thousand men died in that war." Wow, and and interestingly enough, most of them, not most of them, but more of them, died of disease than of bullets. Mm. Um, I, I think one of the the questions that uh, is is very relevant to uh, today is, you know, it, what is the importance of understanding uh, the history that goes on here? You know, as what does that contribute to? how either we operate in a day-to-day or is it just to better understand the place that we live in or the history of our country? What, what do you think are the, the most important things of understanding history like this? It gives you per- perspective. Uh, when you look at COVID today and the uh, people that have died from it, if you look um, 100 years ago, we had the same thing. Only sure. Millions died from the Spanish influenza. Um, there's nothing new in history. Uh, <laughs> it, but it gives you perspective. If you study the Civil War, you learn that war is hell. Um, you know, it's, there's not a lot of glory to it, really. Mm. Um, but, but uh, you know, uh, war brings out the best and the worst in people. Um but, you know, I, I really believe that you do need to study history to have any appreciation for what you have now. And, and also you find out what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, why reinvent the wheel? So. Yeah. I, I think one of the, the interesting things about, uh, you know, being in the South and, and seeing the connection of where you live to what happened in the Civil War is is very interesting. Uh, and a lot of dots are connected. Do you, do you think that that's important for somebody who's living in Nashville um, to connect those dots, e- even if it's not, you know, part of their family's history or if they're moving in from California or New York, how important do you think it is to understand where you are living in the context in, in which that city has grown up in? Uh, the the history of, of where you're living because you can understand the people who live there. You can understand why they feel the way that they do, whether they're wrong or right about it. Um, and um, it, just as in battle, uh, the land has a lot to do with it, the terrain, the climate. Um, like during the Civil War, nothing was black and white. You know, uh, Nashville was in the Mid-South. It sure. wasn't part of the Deep South. Right. Um, and and uh, Kentucky uh, refused to choose sides. <laughs> Na- uh, Tennessee took a while to decide which side it was on, <laughs> and two-thirds of it was Confederate, and the eastern third of it was was federal yeah. uh, union. Um, but... There are trends um, that that happen that um, still uh, are relevant today. Sure. Uh, whether it's totally obvious or not. Right. Um, you look at back during the war, uh, the Republicans and the Democrats mm-hmm. uh, it's kind of switched a little bit since then. Yeah. But, uh, politics um, 
politics have a lot to do with with war and oh, not yeah. just all military yep. generals and, and so forth. Well, if you look at most politicians, on uh, most of them make their money from war. <laughs> right. So uh, going back a little bit, um, um, Tennessee was the last state to join the Confederacy. It was the first state to be readmitted back into the Union. So in a way, Tennessee was somewhat of a leader in the Reconstruction effort. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, there were hard feelings, but it was time to move on. Yeah. Uh, even somebody like Nathan Bedford Forrest, who was a fierce Confederate warrior, uh, at the end of the war, he said, go home, be good citizens. Let's, let's move on. If only he fell, um, followed that. Uh, yeah. Because he became the founder of the KKK. <laughs> it, it was like Lincoln also. Yeah. Uh, we are all Americans. Um, they were all Americans fighting during the Civil War. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for coming here on the podcast. I learned a lot about the Battle of Nashville. Well, where can people uh, purchase one of your books? I have a website. It's at uh, www.zimcopubs.com, uh, uh, Z-I-M-C-O-P-U-B-S.com. Uh, my publishing is, uh, company is uh, Zimco Publications. I have six books up there for sale. They they can be bought off of Amazon, also other online outlets, and um, I'm looking forward to publishing my seventh book early next year. There you go. So so what is um, what are some of the topics that you haven't gotten into that you're excited to get into? Well, it, it's funny you ask that because my next book is going to have like 25, 30 chapters. Woo. Each chapter is going to be about something different. Wow. Uh, every, can, we, can we ask what the theme of the book is? Uh, it's the theme of the book is it's uh, about history, things that I like to write about. Okay. <laughs> um, there's chapters in there about Jimi Hendrix. There's chapters about sock monkeys. There's chapters about nuclear weapons. Uh, there's chapters about uh, football, football okay. games, uh, the 1960s. Um, there you go. All kinds of things. That's awesome. I love it. Um, Mark, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. And uh, no doubt we'll have you in again, talk more history. And uh, I look forward to, to digging into uh, digging into to your books and, and looking forward to that uh, next book because it sounds like a lot of, of fun things and exciting things. And, and we'll definitely have you on again to talk about it. If it wasn't fun, I wouldn't do it. So <laughs> I, I'm, thank you for inviting me, um, Aaron and Stuart, and I had a great time. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Thank you for listening to that episode with author Mark Zimmerman. If you've made it this far, congratulations. You are our hero. And to reward you, we will actually be talking about the future of Fort Negley with the master plan in the next few episodes. They've got a lot. Yeah. You, I'm very excited about this. Yeah. If you want to uh, look at the different designs that we have, head over to our Instagram, explorexplr.tn. All of our designs are going to be on there, and you could purchase one right now yeah, with so our Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Christmas, New Year sale. <laughs> it's the best sale that you're ever going to see there. You can DM us on xplr.tn as well to get the offer. See you on there. Thank you for listening to Nashville Daily. To learn more about today's episode, visit NashvilleDailyPodcast.com. And to stay connected, head to our Discord, and you can find the link at NashvilleDailyPodcast.com slash connect. Nashville Daily is now offering tours. If you'd like to take a tour of downtown Nashville, head to the link in the show notes or find out more details at NashvilleDailyPodcast.com. Nashville Daily Podcast is an Explore.Nash production, copyright 2022.